pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Is that good? Oh, that's good. Look at that. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, Josiah. Um, I asked, um, as, as I said before, when I ask for prayer, I really do mean it. And so um, I ask for your continued prayers for uh, for me. I'm feeling a little bit better, but it's still lingering, as you can hear. Um, but uh, we trek on. And we are going to uh, postpone our vision charrette uh, for next week, as I said earlier. Um, and so parts of the sermon really will prepare us for next week, I think. It'll be, it'll be good. So we continue our seasonal focus of epiphany, or God revealing himself through Jesus Christ to the world. Often we discover that these revelations or manifestations will surprise us, take us by surprise. So I want to just recall some of these manifestations or epiphanies or revelations for a moment. We heard about pagan magicians traveling moor and mountain, field and fountain, uh, drawn towards the Christ child, the Magi. That was a surprise. We heard of the eternal, incarnate Son to take away the sin of the world, that he went to be baptized. That was a surprise. And that this same Messiah, that his very first miracle was to change an absurd amount of water into wine. Not just any kind of wine, but the best tasting wine in all of Canaan. Right? Um, that was a surprise. So far, these are really pretty surprising manifestations of Christ and his ministry. Um, there is a similar surprise happening for us this morning both in our Old Testament reading um, and in our Gospel. And so this morning, I want to focus primarily on our, on our Old Testament reading from Nehemiah. So if you'd like to have that open in your, in your order of worship, please feel free to have it available for you. Well, I find, and maybe you can relate, that Old Testament lessons feel like they go right over your head. They're kind of like the addition that we don't listen to maybe as attentively as perhaps the other ones. Um, the importance of what's being said can be missed if you don't have the bigger picture in mind, too. Um, also, and this may just be me, but whenever a reading contains a bunch of names that we don't recognize or can really find ourselves hard to pronounce, God bless Dr. Beer for his efforts, um, we just kind of let it go in one ear and out the next um, and move on. But there is such a rich, surprising revelation of God's work in his people at this point of time that can also be relevant to us in our new season of dreaming and envisioning a new future together. So some context is obviously needed here for Nehemiah. Well, last week we heard from the prophet Isaiah who was speaking to an exiled people, um, and that he was giving hope to their present circumstances of living in a foreign and pagan land. Um, and he was saying that this will not always be the case. And he said, I will not keep silent. For your sake, I will not keep silent. He said, quote, You shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You will no more be termed forsaken, and your land be no more termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married, for the Lord delights in you. Isaiah was giving such rich and hopeful words. And it's not only hopeful in terms of physical land and place, but most importantly, the Lord's relationship to his own people, how God actually perceives her and receives her. He declares delight in them. Now this will be the first surprise for them to hold on to as they come back um, into their own land, back home. And so we come to Nehemiah. 
where Isaiah gave the prophetic voice of returning from exile, Nehemiah really is a prophecy fulfilled. They're back home. But Nehemiah is filled with a bit of mixed emotions. The people have returned from exile, yet they return to a city torn and decimated and in need of rebuilding, in need of dreaming. They're not the same people. Literally, they're not the same people. Um, years have passed and new generations have sprung up. And there are families who were born in exile and only knew the foreign and pagan lands and culture. They knew that this wasn't home, and yet they had never experienced or lived in their actual home. This is why the reading of the law is so significant in Nehemiah. Now, it can be easy to miss some details here, um, but much of what's happening as it's getting unpacked in Nehemiah reminds me of our own approach to worship. Maybe you heard it too, very subtly. Um, the text begins stating that the people gathered as one man. It's an interesting phrase, gathered together as one man. Well, there is a sense of unity to the people of God. And we also heard this at the beginning of our text from 1 Corinthians. Paul says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Our common bond that we share through the spirit is not our status, it's not our ethnic background, or any other kind of exterior identity, but it's through our baptism. And such a sacrament unifies even the most different kinds of people. Now, as a unified people gathered together, Ezra, of the priest, was instructed to bring the book of the law of Moses. This was clearly the whole law of Moses. Not only the Ten Commandments, but, but all the laws pertaining to the life of Israel, which the Lord had commanded. Again, this reflects a bit more of our service. Ezra stood up a wooden platform to make the word heard to the people. But also, when he opened up the book, what happened? People stood up. Well, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, people approached and actually had their bodies turned towards the word of the Lord. And there even was a call and response to the word of the Lord. Ezra, it says that Ezra blessed the Lord, and the people answered, Amen, Amen. They lifted up their hands, they bowed their heads, and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. What we discover in the Bible, and what we see and try to practice together here, is that worship is truly a physical participation. It involves our bodies and ourselves. Like the people of Israel, when the revelation of God comes to us, it elicits a physical response. And what's very clear from our text is that the people were hungry to receive the word of the Lord. The text tells us they listened attentively, savoring what they were hearing from Ezra. The text tells us they heard it from early in the morning until midday. Now it could also be assumed, friends, that this was probably their first time hearing it. Verse 8, it gives us a clue. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Well, these Levites, or really what I'll call, well, they're, they're priests, but also modern-day catechists, we'll call them that too, uh, were giving the sense of the law. That means that they were giving the interpretation they were giving a meaning and understanding to things so that the people understood what they were hearing. They weren't just empty words. They were teachers who brought such an interpretation. They were revealing the scriptures and specifically the law to the people. Um, what we discover today in the church, and we've said this a lot um, here at St. John's, but this need of a vast 
what we'll call a, a catechemical awakening. Um, and what I think people are actually more hungry for than we think. So a catechemical awakening, what does that mean? For many people, they are seeing the fruit of drinking the Kool-Aid of the culture and not from the true vine who gives life. They're seeing the fruit of it. They're seeing close friends or their children even walking away from the faith or leaving church. And they wonder what happened. This catechetical awakening is really about going back, going back to our roots. What is the faith once delivered to the saints? How can we make sense of the plain meaning of the scriptures to all generations and in such a way that meets them where they are, right? It's not just about upholding the truth, but to see the truth rest upon hearts of people. And what we know, and maybe you've experienced this, I think you have, is that grace is what makes such an opening possible. And you can see this so vividly in Nehemiah. So it says, after they've, come, after they've made sense of the law, we see another kind of response take place. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. They are obviously weeping because the law opened their eyes to see their wayward hearts. They wept because they were not a people who kept all that the Lord commanded them. Their lives in exile did not reflect what was made sense to them by the Levites. And as we hear the law every week, hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says, we respond, Lord, have mercy, because we know we never meet the standard either. So they are experiencing what St. Paul will later teach on the law. That where the law increased, the trespass increased all the more. Now for too long, we may have dressed up our trespasses and we need them to be brought to the light, to be opened. And so for the people of Israel, their weeping reflected how much their hearts were exposed and brought to the light. Now as good as it is for the law to reveal and to expose us to the light, we know that the law itself does not bring life itself. It does not bring newness of life. The epiphany or surprise revelation from Nehemiah is in his response to the people's weeping. Hear this again, it's so rich. Verse 10. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Why would Nehemiah and all the Levites proclaim such good news to the people? Well, it's because this day is holy to the Lord. It's funny, when we think about holiness, um, a day being holy to the Lord, we think maybe we should have just less chocolates, right? We should be a little bit more pietistic, a little more lowly, right? We might think that true holiness is like the community of believers from the movie Babette's Feast. Who here have seen that movie, Babette's Feast? It's a fantastic movie. One of the best movies out there, in my opinion. It's so good. Um, but in this movie, you have these very pietistic Christians in Denmark, um, and, and, and they're holding strong onto their piety. And so they're invited to this feast, and they're fighting so hard um, not to um, express any sense of emotion or joy when eating this food. Um, yet the food is too good and even overwhelms their moralistic piety. 
What comes next surprises the viewer and especially them. They express, after such a feast, real genuine love towards each other. They, uh, their bitterness starts to subside. Um, they forgive each other openly and explicitly. They call each other brother and sister um, with such sincerity. They, they, they end the night singing and, 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 and going home and rest in peace. Well, Nehemiah's declaration that this day is holy to our Lord and to make it holy is not to weep, but to essentially to keep it a Bebet's feast. It sounds remarkably like a wedding. Again, they're reflecting back to Isaiah's prophecy of hope. What did Isaiah say? For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The proclamation of the gospel of grace, working through the Spirit of God, is what ultimately brings life. Grace wipes our tears, invites us to eat gladly at the wedding feast, and fulfills in us what the law could not do. The law could not proclaim good news to the poor, freedom to the captives, sight to the blind, or liberty to the oppressed. No, that's what Jesus brings. He alone brings such gracious fulfillment. He alone is filled with truth and grace. He sets the table, friends, before you, before you and for me this morning, giving his own body and blood broken and shed for you. This is the holy day of the Lord. The very joy of the Lord is your strength. For he is the God who surprisingly, despite all your failures and all of your transgressions, rejoices over you. That's really good news. He is the God who, in fact, claims you for his own. The Messiah who meets us in our poverty, our captivity, our blindness, and our own oppression comes to declare the Lord's favor over a people brought out of darkness and into his own glorious light and brought out of exile and into a new land with new hopes and new dreams over the horizon. So how might these things speak for us today, um, but especially as we think about next week for our vision charrette? Well, like the people of Israel in Nehemiah's day, they have found themselves in a place of new beginnings and a fresh start with the rebuilding of their life together. You know, many of us perhaps have felt they have been in exile in their Christian walk. And St. John's, in fact, became a place that was truly home for you. And many of you would say that, I think. Now, we have come together to this place to listen attentively to the word of the Lord, making sense of the scriptures. We come with our tears to be wiped by the absolving hand of our crucified and risen Savior. We come feasting and rejoicing at the table set out for sinners like you and me. Now that the Lord has drawn us together and continues to draw people together, we find ourselves growing and moving towards a new future together. And what will this look like? That's the joy of it, really. So this is really the beginning of asking these kinds of questions and discussing them. And in closing, I think it's important to remember that we share in this ministry together. That it's not just about what Father Joe does or what the other clergy do or what the vestry does, but it's what we share together. There's a reason why Paul um, tells us that the church is in fact a body, the body of Christ. Right? Um, I recall, and what we see in the body of Christ is so clearly that each part of the body actually needs each other. 
Let not the hand say to the foot, I don't need you. And I recall hearing about a man who actually, uh, he lost his pinky toe, okay? And he thought nothing of it. He thought, I'll be fine without this pinky toe. Who needs a pinky toe? Isn't it just to do that whole, like, this little baby went to the market? Is that the purpose of a pinky toe, right? Well, as years went on, you know, it started to become an annoyance, and he started kind of like doing this, and his balance was getting off because he had lost his pinky toe. And years went by, and he found himself having back problems, and he found himself having really difficult time to walk, and he realized that even what was most insignificant to him became crucial to the rest of his body. And the same is so true for the body of Christ. That what even made me think would be so insignificant is actually truly what makes this thing work and live and breathe and have its being. That we, in fact, need each other. That we contribute, you and I, you even, contribute more than you think to this body of Christ. So part of coming together for the charrette is hearing each other's voices and realizing how each of us can offer more than we thought we could offer. But ultimately, friends, here's the, the, the clincher. That our trust and our hope is not in ourselves. As Paul later says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servant's sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in the hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The moving forward in vision and ministry is not rooted in our own resumes, degrees, winsomeness, capabilities, or even giftedness, but it's rooted in the ultimate epiphany or revelation of all time that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. It's the message of the gospel where God crashed into our lives by the incarnation, atoned for the sins of the world, was raised for our justification, and is forever our only mediator and advocate with the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. Whatever gifts that we bring to the table, we ultimately see these gifts um, as a means to proclaim the message that we hold on to so dearly. This is the message we put ahead of us and all around us, the message that makes us Christians and keeps us Christians. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the surprising gift of Nehemiah and the work that you were doing amongst the people people coming home, a people in need of rebuilding and revisioning. I pray, Lord, that such a, such a grace would come upon us, such a surprise would come upon us as we dream together for our future. Thank you for this church and the gift of being together. Bless us, and may we see you uh, for who you are as our Lord and as our Savior. We ask this in your name. Amen.